Today we will uh, focus on a, another dynamic graph problem, dynamic all pair shortest paths. Now this problem, we are given a, a dynamic graph and we want to, so what do we want? We want to maintain an n by n uh, distance matrix where n is the number of vertices of the graph. undergoing, maybe I shouldn't call it n by n because n is actually changing here, so a distance matrix of a graph undergoing uh, vertex insertions and deletions. When I say vertex insertions, that includes the edges incident to, to the vertex. So, so in the general step we have some graph with some vertices and edges. And this is a directed graph. And then an update consists of either inserting a new vertex with edges specified to uh, other vertices, maybe only some of them, and there are weights on these edges as well non-negative weights. We, we can generalize it to negative weights, but I will not focus on that here. Uh, and another update is to delete a vertex and all its incident edges. And we want to, at, after each step, we want to be able to compute, uh, to output a distance matrix. So basically a V by V distance matrix where, the, where this entry indicates the distance from the Let's say this is row number i, the i-th vertex, to the, if this is column j, the j-th vertex. So is the problem clear? So what is, what is known for this problem? Uh, so known results. Well, yesterday we looked at an amortized data structure for dynamic connectivity, meaning that it's fast on average. So if we are okay with amortized, an amortized bound, there is actually a result giving a quadratic time here. So this is this is a, over if you this is let's say the maximum number of vertices that are ever in the graph. So basically this is optimal if you want to explicitly output the matrix after each step because the size of the output is n squared. There's just some log factors. But what we are interested in in this talk here is uh, this lecture here is worst case bounds. And I'm going to present today a data structure which has worst case bound n to 2 plus 2 thirds. Uh, I should say this tilde here just means that I hide logarithmic factors. Okay, so this is uh, by Chechik, now let's say Abraham, Chechik, Krininger from Soda 17. So we want every update to be fast, and this is the time we want, where n is the current number of vertices. And I should say this is randomized, so this is worst case expected. Um, actually, it is worst case, it's not, it, the randomization comes in another way, so this is a Monte Carlo data structure. So what does it mean for a data structure to be Monte Carlo? It means that it can give wrong answers, but with low probability in, in, in this case. So there is a slight chance that after some 
update the matrix that the algorithm outputs is incorrect, but it, you can make the probability polynomially small that it goes wrong. There's also a deterministic structure, but, but this is the one we want to show uh, today, but there's also a deterministic bound. of n to 2 plus 3 over 4. This is a result by Torup, I think 20, almost 20 years ago. But uh, this is the one we want to focus on. And this actually, I should say that this has, I have a, an upcoming result at SODA where we improved together with my PhD student, uh, oh sorry, where we improved this to 19 over 7. And this is roughly n to 2.71 something. So it's not a big improvement, but it's a polynomial improvement over this one. And this is also deterministic. But again, we will focus on this one. And in the class, I think we will try to get this bound as well. Because once you have this bound, you can, this, uh, once we have seen this data structure here, it's fairly easy to, to get this bound as well. Your question? Is it easier if the graph is symmetric or uh, if the, there are no weights on the graph? So that's a good point. So we know that if the graph is, has unit, if all the edges have unit weight, we can actually do faster. Um, maybe I should write that somewhere. Um, And this is also something we can look at in class later on. So if the graph is unweighted, then you can do O tilde of n to 2.5, randomized. This is again Monte Carlo worst case. Or you can do, well this is uh, in this new paper, n to 2.6, not 666, just 6 uh, deterministic. Okay. And this seems like a hard barrier to break for a reason I will come back to later on, this n to 2.5. And for symmetric? So symmetric, do you mean uh, un undirected? Uh, no, nothing better is known, uh, worse case. So we, we, we haven't, th these algorithms, they don't exploit that, but it could be interesting to, to see if that could be done somehow. Okay, so before I start explaining the algorithm, so this is basically the pre-processing step of the algorithm. I, I will go through that in a moment. Can you all see the text? Okay. So before I will go through that, I just want to... Um, mention some lemmas that we're going to use. So these are our central lemmas. So the first lemma, I hope you can all see it. So what does it say? Let's just go through it. So we have some constant c greater than or equal to 1. Yeah, think of c as a constant. And we have a, t, a set t, and let's say it has size little t. Then we have k subsets, s1 to sk of t. And let's assume that each subset has size at least q some q value q. Now let u be a set obtained from t by random sampling. So take each element of t and sample it independently with probability p equal to this value here. So this, uh, we take the minimum of something and one just to get the probability not to be larger than one. So that's just a technicality, but this is basically the interesting thing here. And uh, so think, uh, sorry. I have to this Sorry. Could you read what is inside this bracket? Uh, yeah. So so here it, it says. So I think actually wait. Let me see. I think I should call this A. I let's see. Okay. Yes. Now it makes sense, right? Sorry. Yeah. So the the probability is A times the natural logarithm of k times t plus 1 divided by q. So roughly 1 over q. There's some log up here. But roughly we sample roughly probability 1 over q. 
Then with high probability, so probability at least 1 minus 1 over the size of t to the a, uh, this sampled subset intersects each of these k subsets. Right, for each, for i going from 1 to k, si intersects our sample subset. And so our sample subset is not too large. So this is sort of the size you would roughly expect because you sample, you have t elements in t and you sample each with probability roughly 1 over q. And you can use something called Chernoff bounds to show that this bound here holds with high probability. Do you know Chernoff bounds? Anyone who hasn't heard about Chernoff bounds? Okay, but it, we can just leave it as a black box. But it, it's just a way to show that something holds with high probability. We have another lemma here. Uh, and I, I, I call this a pebble lemma. So I think I will maybe show it graphically what's going on. Um, So it's basically a game between two players. Initially, uh, yeah, let, let's call them piles. So, so we have k piles initially, and they are empty. So k piles. And these piles can contain pebbles, like small stones. So then we have a game where in each round, uh, us, like let's say we are the first player, we remove one of the piles, just leave, remove it completely from the game, so then there are only k minus one piles left after the first step. And then an adversary, the evil player two, comes and, and distributes L pebbles anyway, up to L pebbles anyway that that adversary wants between the remaining piles. So let's say we remove maybe this pile. Now it's the adversary's turn. The adversary adds L pebbles, maybe L is, uh, it doesn't have to be exactly L, but up to L pebbles. Let's say that L is 5, and maybe the adversary chose this way to distribute. Now we, we again can remove a pile, and then the, the uh, adversary places up to L pebbles, we remove a pile, and so on. And what, what the adversary is trying to do is trying to get a pile with many pebbles. And what we're trying to do is we want to avoid having any pile containing too many pebbles. So that's sort of the pebble game. So it's a game clear. The adversary tries to create uh, just one, peb one pile with many, like trying to, to maximize the largest pile size. And we try to minimize it. So the K rounds, uh, the game ends. Yeah. So the, if after K rounds, the game ends. Because then we have removed all the piles. But during those rounds, we never want too many pebbles in a single pile. And sort of the motivation for looking at this problem is because we're looking at a worst case data structure. And we're going to see how this relates to the algorithm or the data structure. But basically, the number of pebbles in a pile expresses how much work we have to do in a single update. Right? So if we want a good worst case update time, we don't want too many pebbles in a single pile because then we have maybe have to do a lot of work in a single update. So the lemma here says that, yeah, this is just describing the pebble game. We start with k empty piles. In each round we remove, here it's a strategy for us. We remove the pile with the maximum number of pebbles and then we let the adversary do whatever the adversary wants to do. Right, so in this case here, after we initially we removed this pile because they were all equally good so we could choose any we want. The adversary maybe places the piles like this and the next step we will remove this pile. And if there are two piles with the same maximum number we just choose an arbitrary one of them. Then the lemma says, and we're not going to prove that, that at any point each pile has only order log uh, L times log K pebbles. So L was the number of pebbles the bound on how many pebbles the adversary can place in each round, and k was the initial number of uh, piles. So roughly l pebbles at most, times some log. Is, is the difficult? No. No, it's... Uh, there, there are actually other results in a similar vein, so, so this is... these pebble games are used in many different ways. So this is just one 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 version of it and 
you have many proof techniques that are sort of useful to show many of these results. But it, yeah, it's not a difficult proof, but we will not go through it here. But it's a, it's a clear the game and the lemma, what it says. So the third lemma I, I wanted to show or present before we start is basically a way to handle, to only look at deletions, vertex deletions. So what does this lemma 3 say? It says that suppose we're given a decremental all pair shortest path data structure. What do I mean by that? So here we have an this is a different problem than the fully dynamic problem. The fully dynamic problem we could insert and delete vertices. Here we have a starting graph with yeah, some n, n uh, vertices and any set of edges. And we are allowed to pre-process this graph. So this is a decremental problem. We have a pre-processing step where we can do whatever we want. Suppose that that takes us this amount of time, t subscript pre here. That's the time we use. So if we have a data structure that uses this much pre-processing time and after each, so now we can only delete vertices, after each vertex deletion with the incident edges, we can, this data structure can recompute this, N, this uh, distance matrix in worst case time uh, T del here, T del worst case time. If you have such a decremental structure, then there is a fully dynamic structure, which is what we want, with worst case update time equal to this. So, rem so I, I think, I don't know if I, I pointed this out, but there's a restriction on this decremental structure. It can only ha handle up to two times delta deletions. So we have a pre-processing step, and then this structure, decremental structure, can handle up to two times delta deletions. Delta is what something we choose ourselves before it cannot be used anymore. If you have such a structure, then you have a fully dynamic structure with this amount of worst case update time. You say t pre divided by delta plus t del plus delta times n squared. We probably will have, maybe we'll have time in the class to show this lemma, but we're just using it as a black box now. But is it clear what this lemma is saying also? Right. It's a reduction from fully dynamic to decremental APSP with a limited number of deletions allowed. Two delta in this case. Any questions so far? Are all the lemmas clear? Okay. So let's move on to the, uh, the description of the, this algorithm with, the, uh, with this time bound here. But I'm going to use this lemma 3 here. So instead of directly presenting this, uh, this result up here, this fully dynamic result up here, I will present a decremental APSP structure. And then we will analyze its running time, and then we'll use lemma 3 to get our fully dynamic structure. So now we're only looking at a decremental APSP structure with a limited number of deletions, delta. Okay, so, so we have a pre-processing step, right? We have an initial graph, we have a pre-processing step, and this slide here shows the entire pre-processing step. So let's go through that. So this is actually the pre-processing function, and it has a helper function called visit. So let's just focus on this part up here first. So we have n vertices. We have a for loop, i going from 1 to log n, seal. Now, basically, in the ith iteration, we want to handle the shortest paths of a certain number of edges, with a certain number of edges. So I should probably, before we can understand what's going on here, I should probably describe something called hop-restricted shortest paths. Um, So, um, 
So given, given, a, given a graph G, and given some natural number H, um, I will use this notation which is similar to what is used down here. And so a shortest at most H, let me just use the same notation, hop path in G is um, a short, so let's say it goes from S to some, some vertex S to some vertex T in G is a shortest path, a shortest S to T path among all paths with at most H edges. And that's what we also call hops. So whenever you see hop, you should just think of edges. So let's, let's show this by example. So we have a, a vertex S and a vertex T. So a shortest at most H hop path from S to T, you take, let's say that H is four, you look at all paths with at most uh, four hops, four edges, and each of them, this one had three hops, each of them has some weight. You take the smallest, the shortest such path. We have an extra restriction that you cannot use more than H hops, so it's not like a normal shortest path, it's a shortest path with an extra restriction. Is the definition clear? Among all paths, if you just ignore the weight function, look at all paths with at most H edges. Now look at the weights of them and take the cheapest one. That's the uh, shortest at most H hop path. How can you find such a, path, a shortest path? Can you do that with Dijkstra's algorithm? Well, if you run Dijkstra's algorithm from S, it will find a shortest path from S to T, but it doesn't care how many edges there are. It just cares about minimizing the weight. So that, it, you cannot use Dijkstra's algorithm to find these paths. Is that clear? I, I mean, we cannot use Dijkstra at least directly on the graph. But what we can do is we can use Bellman-Ford. So who here is not familiar with Bellman-Ford's algorithm? Okay. So, so just a very quick uh, summary of, of Bell, Bellman Ford. So basically, what it's doing is um, uh, is everyone familiar with relaxa edge relaxations? Okay. So repeat and let, there. There's a special case where you, if you have negative cycles, let's ignore that because we're not looking at negative edges here. So repeat n minus one times. So this is just a for loop. Relax all edges in any order. So this is, this is a, so we have, as input we have a graph G and a starting vertex S. If you run this algorithm here, then you will find a shortest path tree from S. You will find shortest paths from S to all the vertices. Could you recall what, what it means to relax all edges? Well, so relaxing an edge, so yeah, we, we also have an initialization step where, so let's, let me draw that here. So we have our S vertex and then we have all the other vertices. We have an initialization step where we say we don't know what the distances are, but we, we just have an estimate. So we say that the distance from S to itself is zero, and the distance to all the others are infinity. So this is actually, it should be in here, that's initialization step. And now, uh, when you relax an edge, you have some estimate here. These estimates are changing. Let's say we have four here, and maybe six here. 
that means that so far, so S is down here, so far the best distance we have, uh, the shortest path we have found so far has weight 4 to this vertex and 6 to this one. Okay, let's say that this edge has weight 1. Now if we relax this edge, that means we check can we get a better path to this guy, to this vertex, through this edge here. Yeah, we see 4 plus 1 is 5, so that's less than 6. So in that case we would change this to 5. That's a relaxation step. Okay, so if for instance this had weight 3 and we relax this edge, nothing will, ch will change because we didn't find a better uh, path. So this is Belmont Fort. Repeat this many times, relax all the edges in any order you want. And then you can show that, assuming there are no negative cycles reachable from the source, that this will give the shortest path to all the vertices. So basically, this n minus 1 comes in because that's the largest number of hops you can have in a, short, in a simple shortest path, right? If you have in the in the worst case, or in the, the most extreme case, your graph, your shortest path is just one long path containing all the vertices of your graph. So there are n minus 1 edges on this path. And that's why you need to re repeat this n minus 1 times. So you can show that basically in the first, after the first iteration, if you look at any shortest path from S to T, after the first iteration, this vertex will have, had, will have its correct distance estimate from S. After the second iteration of this for loop, this, this will also have its correct distance from S, and, and this cannot change anymore, so this is also correct. After the third iteration, this one will have the correct distance. So if you repeat this many times, then even if the path is the longest possible, containing n minus 1 edges, you will get that the distance to this endpoint here is the correct one. Now let's look at this definition up here. Let's say we have a shortest at most h-hop path from, from s to t. How many times do you think you need to run to repeat this to, to get such a path, to have found such a path? Yeah, so we just put in h here. Because now we don't care about very long paths measured in a number of edges. We just care about the shortest path that has the restriction that it has at most h hops. So you basically you can modify Bellman Ford and you repeat this and you relax all the edges and you, in this way you can, you can compute this at most h uh, uh, hop paths. Okay, so if you ever, if Belmont Ford finds a path with more than H edges, you don't take it, basically. Um, and there's one more thing, when I talk about shortest at most H hop paths, I will assume that it has a minimum number of edges. So if you have two, if you have more than one such path from S to T, pick the one with the fewest number of edges. And you can do that with Belmont Ford as well. Just uh, so I'm assuming that we minimize the number of edges on the path if there are more than one such path. Is it clear? So if H is five, and you find a shortest path with the most five hops, and one of them, one such path has four hops, and another has three hops, and they have the same weight, you will pick the one with only three hops. But we'll never pick one with more than H hops because we have this restriction here. Okay, so let's go back to the pseudocode. Um, so basically, we have this, these iterations, i going from 1 to roughly log n. In the ith iteration, we pick, we set hi to be 2 to the i. And this hi indicates the number of hops we're interested in. So, so in the ith iteration, we're interested in, in shortest paths that have roughly 2 to the i hops. So, so basically, 2 to the i hop restricted paths. Now we, we pick x to be something uh, complicated here. It's roughly uh, log n, but it has to do with this, this uh, numerator here. 
So we're going to use this lemma one here. Okay, so this is just roughly log n. Now we pick ci, we let ci be the empty set. So, so basically we're going to construct a, a set of centers. So let me illustrate that. Um, So we have our graph G, we, we are talking about the pre-processing step. We want to construct a set of centers, CI, so that with high probability we will hit any hop, uh, HI hop restricted path. So if you look at uh, a path with, let's say roughly HI hops, so roughly HI hops, we want that this is hit by one of our centers with high probability. So between every pair of vertices, if there is an, uh, an at most HI hop restricted shortest path, we want to ha hit at least one of them with our set of centers. There could be many, many such paths, but we just want to hit one of them. We want to do that for all for all vertex pairs where such a path exists, we want to hit it with our set of centers with high probability. Do, do you see which lemma is interesting for, to ensure this? What, uh, and what is the connection? Maybe it's too obvious, but... It's obvious there's one lemma talking about probability. <laughs> Yeah, so it's lemma one here, right? So, so basically T will be our set of vertices, our entire set of vertices, and U will be our set of centers. Okay? And we want to hit all these subsets SI. These subsets SI, what, what, what should they be? In this setting over here? Sorry? Yeah, so it's uh, the vertex sets of these hop restricted shortest paths here, right? So if you take such a uh, at most HI hop restricted path, you look at its vertex set, that would be one of our sets over here. But just to avoid having too many subsets, we, we assume that there's only, we only pick one such path between every pair of vertices. So we just want to hit one of them. Okay. So if you want unique shortest paths, you can always do some lexicographic uh, ordering of the paths and just pick the lexicographic first one. But, but I, I don't want to go into details with that. Okay, so initially we, we just set CI to be empty and then we go through every vertex V. We do exactly what the lemma says we should do. We should sample each uh, such vertex V with probability x, which was this value here, divided by hi, which is q, q corresponds to hi, right? So this is exactly, this fraction here is exactly this fraction here. And then we add it to ci if it was sampled. So now we have our set of centers. And because of this lemma, we will hit with high probability all these hi hop restricted shortest paths. Now we want to visit some nodes. Uh, nodes and vertices are the same here, so um, I will use them interchangeably. Uh, so initially we haven't visited any vertices, so RI indicates the set of vertices we have visited so far. What, furthermore, for each vertex V, v we set its uh, what's called a congestion counter to be equal to zero. So. Ci, because we are in the ith iteration of V, is equal to zero. What do you, sh maybe it's not clear yet, but what do you think these congestion counters indicate from what you have heard so far? Well, it's the pebbles, right? So think of Think of the pebble game. Um, so we have the pebble game here, the lemma here that describes our strategy. 
Think of the piles as the, uh, all the vertices V, the, they are the initial set of piles. And these congestion counters basically indicate how many pebbles there are in each pile. Initially there are zero pebbles, that's how the pebble game starts. Okay, but it will become more clear what, what, what this congestion means, but it has something to do with how many of these paths. So we're going to find, find some hop-restricted paths and these congestion counters indicate how many paths go through a certain vert uh, a given vertex. So if a vertex has large congestion, it means that there are many of these paths that go through it. And we want to minimize that number. So what, what happens now? So we check, is there a center which is not visited yet? So while the set of centers minus the set of vis visited nodes is not empty, we pick we pick a vertex V from, from this set here, but we pick one with, with maximum congestion, right? Because that's our strategy here. We want to pick the pile with the most pebbles. So it's exactly the pebble game we're doing here. And then we're going to do a call to this function visit V comma I. So let's, let's, let's look at that function here. Let's see. So what is this function doing? First, so we're visiting this vertex V with maximum congestion that we chose up here. First we're constructing a graph G i comma V, G i V, which is the original graph G minus all the edges incident to visited nodes. So let's draw it here. So we have our graph, I mean in the first step we haven't visited any vertices but in, in the general step we have visited some vertices already maybe this one this one and this one and we're uh, and we're visiting now the, f the the fourth vertex v the graph we're constructing here is the graph g minus these visited vertices here so you delete them and therefore all the edges incident to them are also removed so that's graph g i v take the edge set minus all edges that are incident to previously visited nodes. Right, so we haven't added V to our set RI yet because we're visiting V now. Now what we do, so let's say that V, v is maybe this vertex here, this is the one we are visiting now and these were the three previous ones and we removed them. So what do we do now? We run HI iterations of what I described over there before, from V in this graph GIV and also in its reverse graph. The reverse graph you get by flipping the orientations of all the edges. Okay, so basically what you're going to get now, let's take first the uh, iteration of Bellman 4 from V. You get some HI hop restricted paths to all the all the vertices that can be reached by such paths. Yeah, by, by, yeah, by such paths. So maybe the, the, this, these were the paths found from V by Billman Ford. Now the weird thing about this is that these paths do not need to form a tree. So the way I drew it here doesn't need to be the case. You could actually have one path that goes like this. Because, why is that? Because maybe this subpath here has more edges than this subpath here, but this subpath is more expensive. You see that? Like, if you only have two edges here, from, from V to this vertex here, but here you maybe have three edges, it makes sense to use this, if, if this subpath is heavier, it makes sense to use the subpath if you want to reach this guy, this vertex here, because maybe you use too many edges to this vertex in order to reach this vertex. Does that make sense? 
So therefore, this is a more complicated than a shortest path tree. But you should just think of them as individual shortest paths that can overlap in some weird way. But it's important to note that it's not, it's not the same as a, a shortest path tree. Now we also do that in the reverse graph. What does that correspond to? We flip all the edges, but that's the same as computing shortest hop restrict, HI hop restricted paths to V, right? Because we are computing from V in the reverse graph, that's the same as computing shortest hop restricted paths to V in the original graph. So we basically get in paths to V and out paths uh, from V. And we're going to call these paths that we find, we're going to call this is an out path from vertex x and also we have paths going into v from vertices x. That's what we do with v. When we visit v, we compute these out paths and in paths with this uh, restriction hi on the number of hops. And now we add V to our set of visited vertices. So we add V to Ri. So now V is also visited. So when we go to the next iteration, right, then, we'll, then we'll remove, when we, when we visit the next vertex after V, we will also remove V, including these three here. So we, right, because we are adding V to Ri here. Now what do we do down here? Now we want to, con to, to congest vertices because we basically, Maybe I should remove some of these paths so it's more clear. Let me just draw one path from V. When we add this path here, when we find this path here, we're basically storing that path. If you look at all the vertices on this path, they're basically being congested because, because there's a path, we found a path going through them. So their congestion number should increase by one. All the vertices uh, on this path here. Okay, and that's basically what's, what is happening here. So for each u, we, 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 don't, we don't congest these vertices because they are removed, right? So there, there are no paths going through them. We take the congestion counter and we increase it by this value here. And this basically expresses the number of paths that you belong to, right? So, so if this is v and this is x, we're basically checking how many, how many x's are there for which u belongs to the path from v to x or the path from x to v. Is that clear? So we also, we also have some in paths where we also congest the vertices on those. Okay, and finally, this is the last part of visit, we, we have this value here. This is basically a distance through V from S to T. So let's say we have, let me draw it here. All right, so we're looking at all pairs of nodes S and T. Um, I guess it should actually be V minus uh, the set of visited vertices. Otherwise, this doesn't make sense. So we exclude, we exclude, exclude those we visited before. We're basically now storing the weight of this path we found plus the weight of this path we found. Right? So this is the length of a path from S to T that goes via V and each, each such path is the shortest HI hop restricted path, each of these. And then we are done with the visit function. So that's when we visit a, we took the one with largest congestion, we visited it and now we removed it basically uh, from, from this graph here. So next time we call this visit function, V is removed. Now we check, so here we chose uh, 
uh, a center vertex, one of the sampled vertices with largest congestion. Then we also check, is there a non-center node with largest congestion? So, right, so let me, let me draw it here. Remember, we sampled some vertices. That was our set of centers. And now basically what we're going to do is we're taking, I'm just going through this again, we're picking the center node with largest congestion. We visited it, so we, we, we compute these in and out trees, and that will congest some vertices in the graph. And now we, we add it to our eyes so and it will be removed. But now we don't, we don't take the next center vertex with highest congestion. We don't take the next one with highest congestion. We look at non-center nodes, those that were not sampled. They, they, they can also become congested. And now we pick one with largest congestion among those. That's what we're doing here. This is non, not sampled node, that's basically non-center node, a node that has not been sampled with largest congestion, and then we visit that as, uh, again. Assuming there is one. If there are no uh, such nodes, we just skip this step here. So we, we just put one? No, no. Uh, so we keep on doing that until all the center nodes have been visited. Okay. So let me, let, let's go through it again. So, so we one center and one center. One center. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we visit a center node, then we remove that, we, we, we add it to our set RI, then we visit a non center node with largest congestion, we remove that, then we visit a center node with largest congestion, remove that, take a non center node if there is one, largest congestion, remove that. And we keep on doing that until all the center nodes have been removed. So we alternate between center nodes and non center nodes. And once we don't have more non-center nodes, we just pick the remaining center nodes. So is it clear what, the, what this is doing? It's not clear why it's doing it, but hopefully it's clear what is going on. And finally, for each pair of nodes S and T, this is the last part of the pre-processing, we constrict, construct a sorted list Li of S, T containing all these visited nodes sorted by the, their values the delta i, s, v, and t. So basically what we're doing at the last point for each pair s and t, we look at all the vertices that were visited, v, and then we look at the distance we found through them down here, this, this value here. Right, so, so for each visited node, we get a distance from S to T via that visited node. And we do that for all the nodes that were visited, maybe V prime over here. And then we keep a sorted list of all these distances here. So if, if this one has distance 12 and this one has distance uh, 16, then you will put V before V prime in this list here. So you keep them in sorted order by there, by this distance. Is that clear? Any questions? That was a pre-processing. Okay, no questions? So let's see now what happens in the so now basically we're going to describe the update step. Remember we want a decremental APSP structure with a pre-processing step and then it also has a, a deletion step. Let me just move down to, to the, uh, this is the deletion process. Now this deletion process, it actually, what it, it does is it deletes a batch of, vertis, uh, of vertices. So, so we have our initial graph from the pre-processing step. And now this update procedure here has as input 
a set of nodes D. So we don't delete a single node, we're actually deleting D nodes where D is specified by the user. But remember, what did we want? We want to use lemma 3. We want to be able to support up to roughly delta, so two delta deletions. Now you should think of um, what we're actually interested in is we're interested in a sequence where we first delete this vertex. Uh, maybe that was the first vertex deleted here. Then the second one, third one, fourth one, in the fourth update and so on. So we have one deletion per update. How can we use this batch process to, to handle these single deletions? Like if, when we delete the, f the first deletion, we, we can handle that with a batch deletion of just pick D equal to that single vertex. Now we come to the, the second deletion, now we have two vertices. What, sh what you should think of is basically when you delete, when you run the batch deletion for the first vertex, you roll that algorithm back to the beginning so that now we, we again have the initial graph from the pre-processing step. And in the second update, we delete two vertices. We pick D to be the, those two vertices. In the third update, maybe this vertex was deleted, we, we apply a batch deletion of these three vertices. But after each update, we go back to the original graph and then we just add one more vertex to D. Is it clear how we can use this batch deletion process to handle these single deletions that come online? seems inefficient but it actually it turns out that uh, that it's it's fine so so that's how it works okay so so let's see what this deletion proce procedure is doing so it picks the maximum h this is a, basically the maximum number of hops we want to handle in one in some way so just don't worry about this for now, it's just uh, some weird value. Now we're, we have a for loop, so again we let i go from 1 to log h. And basically, again you should think of i, 2 to the i, in the i iteration we are, we are handling paths with roughly 2 to the i hops. So in the last iteration we'll handle paths of roughly h hops, do you see that? 2 to log h is h. Now what do we do now? For each vertex v in our set of visited vertices, these were the vertices that were visited in the pre-processing step, um, what do we do here? So for each such visited vertex, we look at, so maybe I should illustrate that. Uh, let me just illustrate it here. So, so we want to, uh, we, we construct this set UIV. So we're looking at a vertex V in our visited set, so let's say V is here. And now basically what we're looking at is we're looking at all the vertices X for which the path from X to V that we found in the pre-processing step has, has an edge, has a vertex deleted on it. Right? So, so if we found a path in the pre-processing step from a vertex x to v and this, this set of deleted vertices intersects this path, so maybe we deleted one vertex, so this one belongs to, to d, if at least one vertex on the path is, is deleted, or it, so it's both ingoing and outgoing paths, right? So we also have the case where you have an if you have an outgoing uh, path which has a deleted vertex. So UIV consists of all endpoints of such paths. Right? So, so UIV will contain this vertex because the path from that vertex to V is no longer uh, there because we deleted something on it. And this, this vertex will also 
if we delete this, is, if this vertex was deleted, this will also be added to, to this set, UIV. Okay, so what do we want to do now? These are the problematic vertices because we don't, we want to basically re re reconnect X to V. Let me just focus on this single path here. We want to find a reconnecting path from this X to V that doesn't go through any of these deleted uh, vertices. So to do that, we have something called a sketch graph. It's called HIV. Uh, it has the same vertex set as G, and it has this edge set EIV, which is initially empty. And here there's a, there's a slight error in the, in the pseudocode, so, but let's focus on that. Uh, each, so we, we, we look at for each Y, now we call it Y, that was disconnected from V. So let's change it to Y here. We, what we basically do is we, we add all the edges incident to Y. So, so take all the edges uh, leaving Y and all the edges entering Y in this edge set E. But this should actually be E minus those edges that are incident to deleted vertices. So what we're doing, we're constructing, so this is, uh, this is G minus our set of deleted uh, uh, vertices. Now we're constructing the sketch graph. For each Y that was disconnected over here, we just take all the, all the outgoing and ingoing edges uh, from G minus D and add that to the sketch graph. So this will be uh, H I V. Is that clear? For every such that was disconnected, either in a, with an in-path or an out-path, we just take all the edges from G minus D and add, that are incident to Y and add them to the sketch graph. Okay, now we look at those Y that were not disconnected. Okay, so here uh, we look, we're looking at Y's that are, so let, let, let me draw it below here. So this is the, the other case. We have some vertex V, we have some vertex Y, and now we're assuming that the path from Y to V, or maybe from V to Y, was not destroyed by this deletion, these deleted vertices. What we do in that case is we find the predecessor and successor of Y on, on this path that we constructed in the pre-processing step, if it has one. So basically, um, so you look at you look you look at this path here, and you just add. In this case, you will add the successor. So this is the successor at edge from Y towards V. In in the sketch graph over here, you had V here, you had Y here. If this is an impath, if this was an impath to V, we will we will not add all the vertices, uh, all the edges incident to it. We'll just add. The, ver the edge going towards V along this path here. So basically what we're doing is we are, we are adding this entire path. Do you see that? We add this entire path to our sketch graph. Because if you repeat this argument on the next vertex, you will add the success of that one and so on. So really what's just going on is that you just take all the paths that were not destroyed, you add them to your sketch graph here. All the, all the paths that were not destroyed, add them to a sketch graph, and all the vertices that got disconnected from this V here, you add all the edges incident to them to your sketch graph. So in general, this sketch graph will contain fewer edges than the original graph because of this step down here. We, we, we should hopefully avoid adding too many edges because of this step down here. Okay, so what do we do now? So this basically describes how the sketch graph is constructed. This illustration over here describes how the sketch graph is constructed. And now we... So do we do that also if uh, V was deleted? 
Uh, so if V was deleted, ah, uh, yeah, so that's, that's actually, uh, uh, yeah, in that case we should actually not do, so we should only look at V in that are not deleted. So, yeah. Otherwise there will not be any paths to it. Um, yeah. Okay, so now what we do is we're constructing, we're computing single source shortest paths from and to V in this sketch graph. So one, once you constructed this sketch graph using these two steps here, you run normal Dijkstra from and to V. So n there's no hop restriction now, it's just the standard shortest path. <coughs> You run it from V in the sketch graph, not in the full graph. Right now, we're basically what we're doing here is we 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 took all those vertices that were problematic. We didn't have a path to V anymore or from V, and we're just computing distances from Y to V and from V to Y in the sketch graph using Dijkstra's algorithm. So that's basically what's going on here. Okay, and then we are updating this, these values here to this. This is a, a new path we found. So once we found distances from S to V using Dijkstra and from V to T, we, we uh, update this value to this sum here. And down here, what we're doing, we're looking at all pairs S and T, and we just, so what are we doing now? Let me draw it here. Looking at all S and T, we're, we're looking at all these visited nodes, V in RI, and we're looking at those, these are the paths that we now, some of these paths were maybe reconstructed using the sketch graph, some of these paths were from the pre-processing step because they were not destroyed. And we just find the best, the best intermediate vertex from S to T. So we try all these visited vertices and we see which, which gives the shortest path from S to T among them. And that's your delta I S comma T. Finally, remember this process here, it only handled up to H, roughly H. So this last step here, uh, so this step here basically handles hops larger than H. Right, so you look at all the center nodes that were sampled on this log H level and there you just brute force it and compute single source shortest path from and to V in G minus D using Dijkstra. So we don't construct a sketch graph here and the reason why we, we can afford this, we'll do that in the analysis, is that this set here is small. Like, remember that when the higher up in the hierarchy you go, the fewer centers you sample. So, so this is why this step here can be done efficiently. Okay, and then we just basically, this is not a really in, interesting step, it's basically once you found these distances you do the same for this uh, log H level, you just compute the best path from S to T via some vertex V in our center, set of centers. Okay, and the final step, we want to find the new shortest path from S to T. Now we're looking at we have this, all these levels of our hierarchy and each level we found a shortest path from S to T at that level. We take the minimum over all levels of that distance we found at that level and that will be the, the new distance. So we, we want to show that that is actually the new shortest path uh, from S to T, uh, the shortest path distance uh, from S to T in this graph G minus D. But we haven't shown correctness yet. We, um, so far we just describe the pseudocodes. So are there any questions? So it was a lot of things to digest. So, but hopefully you, you got the main ideas. No questions? I think maybe um, because I want to write something on the blackboard. Let's take a five minute break and then uh, we'll continue. But please ask if you have any questions about what's going on. So I think before the coffee break, I, 
I want to go through the correctness proof. And then after the coffee break, we will show running time. We'll analyze the running time. So what we want to show for correctness, what do we want to show? We want to show that these values down here, delta S, T, they are actually the shortest path distances in G minus the set of deleted vertices D, right? That's the correctness proof to show that. And here I've written three claims, and the last claim, claim three, is saying exactly that. That delta S, T, when you reach the last line here, is the shortest path distance in G minus D from S to T for all S and T. But this is with high probability. Right, so remember I said this is a Monte Carlo data structure, so it can give wrong answers, but uh, you can do this with the high probability. And think of C here as just a constant that you can pick as large as you want. And N here is a number of vertices, so this is high probability. But before we can show claim three, let's start with uh, claim one up here. And what does claim one say? So, it says, take look at any level i, then for all nodes s and t in, in this graph, g i v minus d, do you remember what g i v was, which graph that was? That was a graph when you, vi in the pre-processing step, when we visited vertex v, we removed all the previous visited vertices. Right. So this is a, a subgraph where you just remove all the vertices that were visited before V in the preprocessing step. So it, this claim says that for all nodes S and T in this graph minus the set of deleted vertices, it says that if there exists a shortest path in this graph from S to uh, some vertex V here, and this shortest path happens to have at most HI edges. So, I want to emphasize, this is not a hop-restricted path. It's an actual shortest path, but if it happens to have at most HI edges, then the claim is that this HIV, which was our sketch graph, actually preserves the distance from S to V. Right, so distance in the sketch graph from S to V is equal to the distance in this graph here from S to V. And symmetrically, you also have from V to T. So you both have outgoing like paths from vertices S to, to intermediate vertices and from intermediate vertices V to, to T. So I will only show the first one because the second one is symmetric. But it, is it clear what, what it's saying? So can you just say once again this GIV is what? So GIV, what we really want is just to have G minus D here. That would be perfect, right? But we cannot say that. What we can say is that in this graph GIV, which is in the pre-processing step, remember, we visited vertices one by one, and then we removed them, right? So we, when we visit the third vertex, we have removed the first two vertices. And that's GIV, if this is V, that's a graph where you remove these two vertices here. We cannot say, this claim doesn't say anything about the graph G minus D, it says something about this graph GIV minus D. It says that the sketch graph preserves uh, distances, but only if the number of hops in such a short, if there is a shortest path with at most as many hops. Okay, so how do we, how do we prove this? Let's see if I can do it here. Actually, I think I will, I will just delete this lemma because we will not need it before or after the break. So just to give me more space. But this lemma was a reduction from fully dynamic to decremental APSP. So proof of claim one. So we, as I said, we're just, and I, I will just show first part of, of claim one because the second part is symmetric, right? So it says if there exists a path, a source path so with that property, so let's assume, so let's pi 
uh, be a shortest path. Um, S to some vertex V in this graph G I V minus D and, and assume pi has at most H I edges. Okay, then we want to show that this holds. Okay, so why is that the case? So we're going to prove it, so this is actually going to be proof by induction on the number of edges of pi. So the base case is when pi has zero edges, well then s is equal to v and clearly the sketch graph preserves it, right? So that's trivial. So let's just show the induction step. So I'm just going to write induction step. Okay, so, so maybe I should draw it here. So let me make a drawing. So this is our graph G I V minus D and we have S to V. This is our path pi. Right. So there are two cases to consider. So let's look at the, the deletion algorithm here. Um, we, we need to look at how we constructed the sketch graph. Right, there were two cases we looked at uh, for each y set here. Do you remember what this UIV set was? That was a set of vertices that were disconnected uh, from, from V by vertex deletion. You remember that? Like you, we had these paths uh, to and from V and UIV consists of all those vertices that are now no, can no longer reach V through those paths because of those vertices that we deleted. Okay, so suppose that, right, so now we're looking at V, we constructed in the pre-processing step, we constructed these in paths and out paths to V. But this is, this is just the shortest path in the new graph here. If, if this vertex S belongs to this set UIV, what can we then say? So we, we're looking at two cases. Either S belongs to this set UIV or it doesn't. What if it, it belongs to the set UIV? What did we do in the sketch graph? Which edges did we add? Sorry? Exactly, we added all outgoing edges, ingoing and outgoing edges, in particular all, all the outgoing edges. So in particular, we added this first edge of pi to our sketch graph. You see that? Th that's basically what we did up here. This should be, not be the entire edge set, it should be minus those that are incident to D. What can we now say in that case? Yeah, because now the first edge of this path here, this was the shortest path from S to V in this graph. The first path is in the sketch graph, but this subpath here is the shortest path with one less hop than this path. So we can use our induction hypothesis to say that, that the, the distance from this successor here to V is the same in this graph as in this graph, right? But then because this edge is also in this sketch graph, then you must have that these are equal to each other. So I'll just write, uh, well, let's say th this is the case 
I'm doing proof by picture here. So this is the case where an S was in U, I, V. All right, then, then it was clear. Let me write it up here. S belongs to U, I, V. Then we could use induction hypothesis. What if S is not in U, I, V? Uh, what does that mean? So we have our vertex V, we have our vertex S. What does it mean that S doesn't belong to UIV? It means that the path pi i, so let me, let me draw the, uh, this is our path pi, this is our shortest path, but the path we found in the pre-processing step, maybe it goes here, this is pi pi I, V, uh, let me just remember the notation we used for that. Uh, yes, pi I, V from S to V. We know that, what do we know about this path? We know it. This is the shortest path from S to V. Well, yeah, it, it, we, it in the pre-processing step, we didn't construct shortest paths. We constructed, it's true what you said, but we just need the, an extra argument. We constructed HI restricted paths, hop restricted paths, right? But, but because S is not in this set, that means that this path was not destroyed by D. Because otherwise, we, that's definition of UIV, right? So this path is still intact even after we deleted the set D of vertices. But what do we know about this path? It's an, it's a, so let me say, let me write it here. So this is a, um, at most HI hop restricted uh, shortest path. What does that mean? If you look at the assumption up here, well, I wrote it here, let pi be a shortest path and assume that it has at most HI edges. What does that mean about this path here? Pi I V, uh, S comma V. It means that it must be, it's the shortest path from S to V among all those that had at most HI hops. But we know that pi is one of those Right? That is a shortest path and it happens to have at most HI hops. So therefore, uh, let me write it over here. So if S is not in UI V, that implies that pi I V S comma V is a shortest path. It was a, sh a shortest path in G i v minus d. And remember, when we did Bellman Ford, we chose one with minimum number of hops. Furthermore, so furthermore, so also, uh, and um, pi i v. S comma V has uh, no more edges than which path? Pi. Than pi. Because we, ch we chose, if there were multiple choices of these hop restricted paths, we chose one with minimum number of hops. And pi had, had, had a certain number of hops, so this minimum number of hop path cannot have more hops than pi. What can we then do? We can use the induction hypothesis, because now we can just say that this successor here, right, 
we added, we are in this case here, we actually adding, we, we added this edge here because this path was preserved, we add this, added this edge to our sketch graph. And now this subpath has smaller number of hops than pi, this subpath from here to here. So we can use the induction hypothesis on this subpath and then we get the claim. Was that clear? So uh, it was mainly proved by, by figure here. Um, so before the break, uh, we will we'll not... So yeah? H -I -D, is it a subgraph of uh, G I D? Uh, yes, yes, yeah. Um, yeah, okay. So I think before the break, I just want to, we, we won't have time to finish the correctness proof, but just take claim two because it's pretty fast. So it says that with high probability for all S and T and V, um, if you have a shortest path S to T in this G minus D graph, if it has at least as many edges here, HI over two, then it contains a center of CI. So it says that if for, for all paths, shortest paths that have enough edges, they will contain a center vertex. We will not show that formally precisely, but which, which result does that follow from? So it's lemma one, right? Like it says that you have these subsets, if they are big enough, so if these subsets have size at least Q, then with high probability they are all hit by your sampled set. And the sample set was exactly the set of centers. So those were the ones we, we sampled, right? So you can easily show from lemma one that claim two follows. So I think we'll take a, uh, the coffee break now and then uh, we'll finish the correctness proof and then running time after, after the break. the distances, distance values we return here in the last line are actually the, the shortest path distances in G minus D. So let's, let's show that. So pick Pick an S and a T. So pick S comma T in V. Okay. First note, first we note that delta S comma T. This is I claim that this is at least um, the, the actual distance here. Why is that true? I mean, we want to show it's equal, so I want, want to show both inequalities. Why is delta S comma T at least uh, this uh, actual source path distance from S to T? Well, that's because all these distances we compute here they actually correspond to weights of some paths, right? We never, we never compute something that is not of the weight of some path. So that, you just go through the code and you see that that's the case. So, so this should be clear just from inspection of the code. But the difficult part is that we want to show... So how do we show this? Um, so, assume that there is a path, uh, path from S to T and let pi be the shortest path. So let pi be a shortest uh, S to T path. In G minus D. 
and it has a certain number of, of hops, of edges. Uh, and pick I such that uh, pi has it's um, let's see so such that the number of edges in pi belongs to uh, hi over 2 to hi. So this is a half open interval. So remember hi was 2 to the i, right? So there must be some uh, some interval like this where the number of hops of pi belongs to, right? Now what can we say? If we use, if you look at claim 2, so now we have at least this many edges of pi, then let's just assume that this holds, it holds with high probability, so assume that claim 2 holds, then it says that it contains a center of CI. So. Let me just write with high probability claim two implies uh, that there is So, so this, um, yeah, this this shortest path from S to T is hit by some vertex V, which belongs to our set of centers. Now, remember how did we do what we did, did we do in the pre-processing? We visited a center vertex, then we visited a non-center vertex, center vertex, non-center, right? Let V be the first, so now we know that there is a, a center vertex V on this path. Let V be the first such visited center vertex. Actually, no, let me say that differently. Let V be the first, not, cent not necessarily center vertex, let V be the first visited So it could be a center vertex or a non-center vertex. But there is one belonging to CI and every vertex in CI was visited. So there must be a first visited node in this ordering in the pre-processing step that is on pi. What can we now say about uh, when it's when V in this way, what can we now say about distances in this graph? this graph here. We want to use claim 1 now. So claim 1 says that if you have a, if there is a shortest path in GIV minus D, so let's check do we actually have a, such a shortest path in this graph? Well, V was the first visited node on this path. And GIV, what was that graph? What was this graph here? That was the graph G minus all the vertices that were visited before V at level I. So therefore, this path I, I've shown you here. So then pi is contained in G I V minus D. I mean, it doesn't intersect D because it, it was a, a shortest path in G minus D. But it belongs to this graph because this graph consists of all of G uh, minus all the vertices that were visited before V. But v was the first 
such vertex visited on this path pi. This is pi. Okay, but we also know, like, we want to use claim one, as I said. We also know that this, so now we know that this path belongs to this graph. We also know that it has at most hi edges. But then the claim one says that, that basically the, the um, sketch graph preserves, basically this contains, or this, uh, contains these paths here from, from S to V and from V to T. So by claim, claim one, um, so yeah, so H I V, so distance in HIV from S to V. Now I'm using both cases of the of the claim. Is equal to the distance in G minus D. Uh, sorry, that was G I E minus D. But that's actually now we know it's also the same. So we can just write it like this. Uh, v comma t, right? That means, but this is actually what is this? This is actually the distance in. Uh, this is actually the shortest path distance, the length of p pi. So this is actually equal to uh, d g minus d. Sorry if you cannot see this for s comma t, right? And this. Because with, this is basically some distance that is computed at some point here. And since we're taking, I'm, I'm going a bit quickly over this because I, I think it's, we, I want to get to the running time analysis also. But basically, because you're computing such a, a distance here and you're taking the minimum down here over all choices, that therefore uh, this inequality holds. Here you're taking the minimum over all these choices, and one of these choices will actually be set equal to the, the weight of pi. So I hope that wasn't too sketchy, but any questions? Okay, so let's move on to the running time if there are no questions. And this is where we will use the, we will need the pebble game, right? So far we haven't used that. Um, so let me erase these. So now we want to show these claims here. So these claims together will, will give us the running time bound, as we'll see. But let's start with the first claim, claim four. It says, with high probability, this, for all i, the size of the set of centers is no more than O of n log n over h i. Why is that true? <coughs> Well, we use lemma one, right? So if you look at the second case here, this was our sample set, U. It says with high probability, the size of the set is O of this value here. And if you do the calculations, then you basically, you get this bound here. So this follows from, um, from lemma one. Let's go on to lemma, uh, claim five. So now we want to look at the pre-processing steps. So let me go back to the pre-processing code here. We want to analyze how long does it take 
to execute this. So proof of claim 5 which says that the running time of the preprocessing step is n cubed times some log factors. So why is that the case? So let's look at the code here. So what is going on here? Well, we have this, we have a logarithmic number of executions of the outer for loop. And we do something that takes constant time here, it takes linear time in V. Uh, this also takes linear time in V. But the complicated stuff really goes on when we do these calls to visit. So the heavy part is to run Bellman Ford down here. Um, so what is the time to, to run Bellman Ford? So let's look at one visit V for index I. It says that we should run HI iterations of Bellman Ford from V in this graph here. So Um, so let's look at the time for visit v comma i, capital V here. So really the, constructing this graph is not the bottleneck, the bottleneck is running Bellman Ford. How, how long does it take to run hi iterations? H i times n squared, right? Because it it was uh, the number of edges times the number of iterations, and the number of edges we can just bound by n squared. So, so that was uh, um, from v and its reverse graph. So it, it's just from from this single vertex v here that we run Bellman Ford in both directions. And then we do something that takes, uh, well, how much does this take to increase these congestion counters here? All right, so we run over all U in this set here. And then we need to increase the congestion counters on all, uh, on all these paths here. So basically what we're doing is, if I illustrate it here, we have V here. We constructed these paths in and out pass, and now we want to run over them and increase the congestion of all of them. How many times do we increase congestion of such a vertex? Well, there are order n endpoints of paths, right? And to traverse a single path, it has at most hi hops, so that's hi, right? So this dominates this, so this is just O of hi n squared. Now the question is, how many times do we call visit on level i? Well, we call visit, remember we took a center vertex, we visited that, then we took a non-center vertex, we visited that, a center vertex. So how many vertices do we visit in total? at most twice the number of center vertices, right? So total preprocessing time so it's well, let, let's uh, there's also this step down here, but this is not a bottleneck, so <clears throat> We want to sum over all i, going from 1 to log n. By the way, when I write log, it's always base 2. Um, of the size of the center set ci times the time for visit, right? h i n squared. What was now, we, we say this with high probability. Um, 
So what, with high probability, what, what bound do we have on CI? Well, that was claim four, right? So claim four says that this is O of some I going from one to log N of this bound on CI, which was N log N over HI and then multiplied by HI n squared. And now you see that these two HI cancel out and you get n cubed and you have log n number of terms so this is O of n so let's ignore log factors O tilde of n cubed and this is uh, basically the whole running time it dominates the whole running time of the whole uh, pre-processing step. Any questions for that? Yes. Yeah? Uh, why, uh, why do we actually have to construct this scrap GID by removing those specific vertices? It seems like we don't use it. And like if we, if we just had the, the graph without uh, removing this uh, uh -huh. rise. So the reason why we remove uh, vertices uh, and construct these GIVs that has to do with this congestion. So if you didn't remove them, you might get some vertices that are hugely congested. Right, so, so when we visit a vertex that was the most congested vertex, we take it out. And therefore, the later pass we construct can never go through that vertex. That's basically what we're ensuring. So it's a pebble game. We remove a pile, basically. That's what... Did, did you use this pebble game already? No, this, this is in the for the update running time. We haven't used it yet. But, so any qu other questions for pre-processing? Okay, so let's go back to the code for the update. We will analyze. <clears throat> so let's just take claim six first, claim seven bounds the time for, for, for this code here. So what does claim six say? It says with high probability each vertex u is hit or is intersected say, by, by only this many paths computed in the pre-processing step. So the paths I'm talking about here are these pi i v paths that we constructed using Bellman Ford. And claim six says that uh, with high probability uh, no matter what vertex you take uh, there's only this many paths from the pre-processing step that, that go through that vertex. Do you see why that is the case? What would you... What, would, what should we use now? Now we want to use a pebble game, right? So... What, what, let's just uh, repeat what the pebble game said. We had this initial k empty piles. In each round we remove the pile with the maximum number of pebbles. Then we let the adversary distribute up to l pebbles in the remaining piles. Then at any point each pile has only this many pebbles here. So why is that the case? Well, Actually, we should go back to the uh, pre-processing step for that one. Let's look at this again. What are, what, what are our piles here? What do they correspond to? I, I said it initially, but at the beginning of the lecture, but what, what should the K piles correspond to here? The set of vertices of, like the vertex set V, right? That's our piles. What about our pebbles? Well, our pebbles, whenever we, we find a path in the, pre in the visit procedure, we add one pebble on each vertex on that path. Because that basically expresses how much work we need to do when we, if we delete a vertex, we need to repair that path. So these pebbles count how much work we need to do when we delete some, one of those vertices. Okay, so claim six. follows from the pebble game from, from, uh, from uh, 
what was the lemma two lemma two since um, so let's say with let's so the number of initial number of piles k is equal to n and what is l here what bound can we say on on l can we get an upper bound on the number of pebbles that the adversary puts on piles well the adversary you should think of the that's the algorithm here when it constructs these paths it adds pebbles so every time we remove a pile the adversary down here can add pebbles how many pebbles can the adversary add so let's use O notation no oh, actually we don't I think we can do it without O notation so so a single visit that's basically the adversary doing its thing in one round how many pebbles does the adversary add um, to the piles can you give up just an uh, upper bound some upper bound doesn't have to be yeah it's completely tight so what does the adversary do so it visit when we visit this vertex v we construct all these outgoing paths and all these ingoing paths to v how long is each such path in terms of number of edges at most hi so how many pebbles are distributed in, in total hi times n right so this gives a bound hi times n because n n that's the number of choices of this endpoint here the n or n order n choices of those at most n choices and you add at most hi pebbles in each for each of them so if you use this value of l and this value of k here What does uh, lemma, lemma 2 say? It says that then at any point each pile has only order L log K pebbles. And here we have, this is our L H I times N times log K, which is log N. Right here. The reason why, wh why does this only hold with high probability? It's claim 6. Because lemma Lemma 2 says it holds with absolute certainty. Why, why do we get high probability now in claim 6? Well, I guess you could actually, let's see, could actually say it holds with absolute certainty. The only uncertain thing is how many times do we call visit here? Like because the, the, si the number of times we call visit is at most two times the size of CI, but we only have with high probability that the size of CI is this here. But I think even if you do a really crude upper bound, you will still get claim six. So you, you could actually, I think you could actually say this with absolute certainty, but, but let's just formulate it this way because everything is with high probability, everything else. So, so that was claim six. So, uh, why, uh, why, we to, uh, why can't we just remove the center and skip the step of removing the Ah, uh, yeah. The, that's true. So actually, so so yeah. So so there was one thing I, I didn't mention. This is not what we're doing here. Is not exactly the pebble game because we're. The, I mean, we're not actually following this strategy precisely because if we should follow this strategy precisely, we should always pick the vertex with highest congestion. But we're, what we're actually doing is we're switching between picking the center vertex with highest congestion, picking non-center vertex with highest congestion. Um, so it's not completely trivial to say that then you can just use this lemma because we're not following the, the, that game completely. But basically what you need to do is you need to run two pebble games, one for the center vertices and one for the non-center vertices. So if you run it for the center vertices, then in each, in each step the adversary can add at most two, two, uh, two times this number because you basically look at two rounds. So every second round you add, a, 
you remove a center vertex. And then you can just say between two rounds, the adversary adds at most twice this, num this number of pebbles. And then you can do the pebble game for the center vertices and the non-center vertices. But what you asked is why could, why, why don't we just... No, 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 no I, uh, I it was the wrong question. Uh, okay. Because you run to visit the... Yeah, the reason why we switch is because we want to cover all, we want to visit all the center vertices. But the pebble game says, the, the lemma here says that you cannot just choose the vertices as you want. You need to pick them so that with those that are high, most congested. Mm -hmm. But we also want to cover the center vertices. So by, by switching between center and non-center vertices, we both can use lemma 2 and we, we, we get to visit all the center vertices. That's the intuition. Does that make sense? Like if we just followed the lemma, we would not necessarily uh, visit all the center vertices. Then we would have to visit maybe a lot of vertices before we hit all the center vertices. Um, so that's why we do it. Okay, so let's come to, let's take claim seven. That's the, almost the last bit. I also, um, I deleted, uh, removed lemma four that was over here, but I just added a short version of lemma four. So if you remember, what did it say? It, it was this reduction from fully dynamic APSP to decremental APSP. So now we have found a bound on this T preprocessing that's n cubed. And now we want to bound this. This is the worst case time per, per batch uh, update, T del. And then we can use lemma 4 at the very end to, to get our time bound. So let's go back to, to this deletion procedure and show claim 7. So claim seven says that handling this deletion set D here takes O tilde, so we ignore log factors, of n to 2.5 times root size of D. And here we need to choose some parameters. We need to optimize some parameters to get this bound. And actually, this is where this comes in, this first line. This is where we pick H to be this. So we're going to plug that in at some point. Let's look at what, what, what is the running time of this procedure here. So let me just start by writing it up, just by looking at the code. So we're summing over i from 1 to log h. I run it down. Then we're visiting, we're uh, remember R, do you remember what Ri was? What was that set? That was a set of visited vertices, right? The set of vertices we visited in the preprocessing step. So we visit a, non, a center vertex, non center vertex, center vertex, non center vertex. All those we visited, that's our set Ri. So let's just sum. Let's just follow the pseudocode and say we sum over v in Ri and see how much time we spend in this inner loop here. Uh, again, I'm going to skip this last bit because that's not the bottleneck. Uh, let's focus on the, and also these two lines here. Actually, there's an important point here. Uh, if we have time, I will come to that. But let's just focus on, on this part here for now. So what do we do here? Well, we need to construct this set UI uh, and then we need to construct this sketch graph, so this, uh, uh, um, this edge set of the sketch graph. And finally, we need to run Dijkstra's algorithm on this sketch graph. And it's easy to see that the bottleneck is actually running Dijkstra's algorithm. So let's just analyze how, how fast is Dijkstra's algorithm well, it's, if you use Fibonacci heaps, it's the number of edges 
plus the number of vertices times log the number of vertices, right? So we need to we need to bound the size of this set EIV. That's the tricky part, right? So we can just write it like this: EIV, oops, plus n log n, right? That's the time for for everything going on until uh, here, basically. So this is what we want to bound now. Let's, let me maybe write it here. So we want to bound EIV, size of that. Now we need to remember how the sketch graph was constructed. Do you remember how that was done? We need to look at this UIV set. That was, a, so if I draw, draw it here, um, we look at a vertex V. What was UIV? That was the set of, of vertices uh, X that uh, can no longer reach V by those, one of those paths from the pre-processing step because there was at least one vertex in our set D of deleted vertices. It could also be, it could be an in path or an out path. What did we do with those vertices? What, in the, when we constructed the sketch graph, what did we do with those vertices X? We added all edges. Yeah. So we just like this. So we want to give an upper bound on this. Well, we can say that if we look at the size of UIV, times N, that gives a bound, we sum over all X in UIV, and we say that there are N minus one edges, or N, well, no, two N edges, order N edges, so actually I should let me just use O notation so we don't need to worry about these constants because there are edges in both directions. Right? So that was if X belonged to UIV. What if X didn't belong to UIV? That means that this path is preserved. How many edges do we add in that case? Two. So that will be just be plus two here. So this is actually what dominates the thing. Okay? Now the question is, what is, can we give a bound on UIV, size of UIV? So, this is where the pebble game comes into play. So, what is, can you, can you explain? Can we express the size of URV using this pebble game? So we want to bound UIV. Well, how many vertices do we delete? We delete order D vertices. So it must have something to do with the size here somehow. And what else do we need to, what do we need to multiply this with? Well, for each vertex, we, we can assume it's with high probability, but let's just say that it holds. We can assume that there was, uh, there was uh, let's see, where was it? Um, six, claim six, right? Each U is hit by only this many paths computed in the pre-processing step. So what does that mean? It means that if you, if you remove the, uh, this many vertices here, then there, for each of them there's only this many uh, paths that are hit by it. So it should be HI times N log n, and we need to multiply that with more. Let me 
just need to see if I don't screw up anything here. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Yes. So this this is basically the number of paths that we destroy, and for each each of them we can only we only have uh, n choices for this endpoint here. So basically, uh, there are n n such endpoints of paths. So we need to basically multiply this number by n, so we get n squared. Right. So this is a number of endpoints we, we need to multiply by an extra factor of n here. So, so in total, so if you put that in, you get the size of EIV is O of, uh, did I mess it up now? I think actually, uh, no, no, this should not be multiplied by n, sorry. Basically, this many vertices we delete. For each of them, we, uh, each of them can be hit by at most this many paths. And each such path defines an endpoint, an X endpoint. So we actually just have this number here. Sorry about the confusion. Was that clear? Like we, we need to count the, num the size of UIV. So we need to count the number of Xs that were destroyed, uh, where the path from X to V was destroyed. And we have this many deleted vertices, each of them hit with high probability only this many paths, and each such path defines an X in UIV. Okay, so now we can bound the size of EIV by just taking this times N. So this is size of D times HI times N squared log N. Actually, I'm just removing the log N, just write tilde here. And now we can continue our calculation over here. I'll just write I here. We're summing over the same set. The same range. And then we plug in this. So this is size of D times HI times N squared. And I ignore log factors and this this dominates this part here, so this is just this bound here. Okay, and now let's look at this here. So we're summing over uh, V in Ri. So how many such terms are there? Can we express that in some other way? Remember, Ri was a set of visited vertices that was at most twice the number of center vertices, right? So this is, we just get a constant factor 2 here times size of D, Hi, and squared. Right, so this, this no longer depends on V, so I'm just multiplying this by the size of Ri, but the size of Ri is at most twice the size of the number of centers, because we visit at most twice as many vertices as the center vertices. And now we can use our bound which hold with high probability for C uh, Ci. That was claim 4 here, right? So we plug that in. And we get, uh, let's see, I'm ignoring log factors, so this is n over hi times the size of d times hi times n squared. And now we see that these cancel out. Uh, did I mess something up here? So UI is a subset of the vertices, right? Sorry? UI is a subset of the vertices, right? Yes. Then our bound on this is something super small, right? Because we only have one. Uh, yeah, this is something strange here, right? Yeah. Um, what did I mess up here? 
Um, ah, sorry, this is actually the sum over all vertices v, right? Yes. That must be it. So this is actually the sum, sorry about that. This is the sum over all v in ri. That's what I wanted to bound. And now <laughs> we need to start over here. Sorry about that. So basically now, um, yeah, we shouldn't, we shouldn't do this calculation either. We should actually split it up so that we look at the total size of all these EI sets here. Uh, so this is also the sum over all V in RI. Right, Th this is the total number of edges in all the sketch graphs. So now we can take this sum Hope this is correct now. Size of D times HI times N squared. And then we get this one here, um, which is, I'm ignoring the log factor here. So what is the size of RI? That's tw at most twice the size of CI, which we had this bound on. So that's N over HI, I'm ignoring log factors. Let's add a tilde here. Uh, times n log n, n squared. Hope this is correct now, so let's try to calculate. Uh, so maybe I should actually add what we sum over here, so i going from 1 to log n, uh, log h. So this is basically 2 to the i, remember that, right? So this is a geometric sum, this term here. What is the biggest term? That's when you, I, I is equal to log h, floor. So this is just, you just get h here. So this is O tilde of size of d times h times n squared. And then we have this one as well. Well, this is also just a geometric sum and it just becomes n squared. So this is, basically this one is, is dominating the whole thing. Okay, but now we need to look at what was h equal to. h was equal to root n over d. So now we can plug that in. Uh, root n over root d times n squared, which is equal to n to 2.5 times square root d, oops, size of d. And that was exactly what we wanted to show. Ah, so that, that, that's actually a good point. The reason why we do that is I only explained the running time until this point here, basically. We also have something going on here, and here we actually get something that depends on h in a bad way. So, so you asked if you could pick h equal to, to, to 1, like make this very fast? Yes. Yes, but then you, this will be too expensive. So, so let's see how long does this step take. Here we're taking the minimum over all v in the center set uh, at level log h. We're basically taking all pairs s and t. So maybe just say lines, uh, lines 15 to 17. How much time does that take? Well, we have n squared pairs of s and t. And now we need to go over all v in this center set. What is the size of this center set? Well, we can apply this claim 4 again. This is with high probability. But now we need to pick ci equal to, uh, we need to pick i equal to log h, basically. And then hi will be 
order h. So this will be, so this will actually be, let me write it, n squared times, uh, again ignoring log factors, n divided by h. So this is n cubed over h, and if you plug in that value there, you get the same. So here, here you don't want to pick h small, right? This is a, but there was a good question, so you balance those two things out. So I guess that was sort of the, there's just one more thing that we didn't look at. There was this line here. So what we need to do here is we want to, this is in the ith iteration, we want to find delta i s comma t. That's a minimum over all visited vertices v of the distance from s to t via v. Okay. So how fast can we do that? Could we just afford to go through all these uh, v and all these s and t and just try all combinations? Well, the problem is if you look at the size of Ri, sorry, the size of Ri here, that's at most twice the size of Ci. And Ci we had this bound on, right? Really small, like level zero. So this is n log n. So basically what you're doing at level zero, if you just do it in a brute force way, you're running, you're, you're, you have order n visited vertices and you have n squared pairs s and t, so you use cubic time here, which is horrible. So we don't want to do it, and that's why it has, in the paper, it has this uh, note here to say how you can do that more efficiently. Uh, and basically what you're doing is, if I just go back, we need to look at this list here. What, how did we define that? What, that was in the pre-processing step here. So here we constructed this list here. L i s comma t for all pairs s and t. We constructed this list, uh, which is basically containing all these uh, visited vertices v sorted by these values here. So each list has this. Uh, uh, it has it has a sorted list of of, 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 of vertices here, ordered by these values here. Now, if we go back to, oops, back to the deletion procedure, we don't want to try all v here. Basically, what you're doing is you're only looking at those v where this value has changed. So, some of these entries in this table here are no longer valid because there was some deleted paths, but some other uh, entries here.